Next up is Captain James from Alfresco talking to us about 10 of the latest releases of Alfresco. Gavin, if you're ready, take it away. Thanks. Um, sorry for the delay, and uh, sorry if you're all standing, but um, we'll try and get through this reasonably quickly. So my name is Captain James, and uh, I've been working for Alfresco for uh, about six or so years. Started in the services team, worked on the repository, and now I work on the search and discovery languages. So I'm going to talk about 10 um, novel ways of using Alfresco. And number one is riding a camel. And you must be wondering what on earth I'm talking about. Um, so here's some camel photos to get you in the mood. Um, Jan Monker, who's, I'm not sure if he's here, here's a guy, likes to spice up his presentations with uh, hot air balloons. And he's inspired me to spice my um, presentations up with camel photos. Um, they're a bit disturbing, so here we go. <laughs> a, little, a little bit worrying. Anyway, um, rising a camel, what on earth am I talking about? Well, um, you may know that Alfresco comes with Apache Camel built in. Um, that's the key takeaway from point one, really, that um, if you take Alfresco as it is, you've got a toolkit already built in for you to use. So this is Apache Camel is an integration of the enterprise, uh, implementation of the enterprise integration pattern book. And it's basically got lots and lots of different patterns for you to use. It's a, a toolkit for you to use. It's got message channels, message routing, um, transformations, events, um, scheduling. It's got all those, as well as components that talk to you. So once you create a camel route, you can add a component and use it. And the component, sorry, the component list is, is huge. There's lots of Amazon integrations. There's uh, Bitcoin telemetry, um, logging. Um, there's So basically, what I'm saying is that Use an event publisher and um, send it to a camel route instead. And as I said, you've already got your camel route there, so you can do what you want with it then. In this example, I've got Kafka on the end, um, but you could replace that with anything you want, really. Um, because once you've got it in camel, you could send it to Amazon, AWS, whatever. Um, but uh, I did do this for example, so um, I have got the source code for this, which is available. So I'll give the slides out at the end so you can. Keep these links, but uh, there's a project there that basically just takes the audit data and sends it off as events, and you can do what you want with the uh, events once you're there. But I've got an example of Kafka that I can see, and because Kafka you need a client jars, the second project there just has got the client jars in, it's just an amp which adds the client jars, it doesn't do much more than that. And there's some config going on. I think I've got a demo of this. Good, good. Okay, so what I've got here is um, four um, Docker instances running. I've got the repository, I've got share, I've got the uh, Kafka manager, which is the top one, and Kafka itself. And um, the Kafka manager is just a UI, it doesn't, do too much, it doesn't do much management, more just a UI to visualize a bit of what's going on. So what I'm going to do is connect the Kafka manager to Kafka, and we can see what the local cluster's got running on it. And, as you can see, it's actually got nothing running on it. No, there's no topics. So we've got no topics at all, but it's all running. So let's um, get into Kafka itself. And uh, You may know that Kafka comes with its own logger that you can use to log to the console, just like a demo logger. So what I'm going to do is connect that demo logger um, to the Kafka topic that we're going to have, which is 
This is me cutting and pasting. Um, this is good. I like having a video and having to do it myself. It's quite good. <coughs> okay. So the Kafka Consumer Console, you might see there, is basically going to connect to the Alfresco Audit Events topic, and it's going to um, do it from the beginning. And so when you do stuff in share or um, anything with the prosody, the audit would, that would normally go to the audit log is now going to come out in my console. That's good timing. Yeah, so that's the console. Basically, so the audit events, which would normally be down in the audit table, are now going through um, yeah, through Camel into Kafka and basically into the console here. Um, and just to uh, prove I'm not cheating, I'm going to just change the user. And normally I fast forward a little bit. That's the advantage of having a video, you can fast forward a little bit. <coughs> okay. um, I always like to use uh, Barbie and Ken as my test users. So now I'm going to log in as Barbie and just show you the different, um, different events coming through. Um, you may see there the username Barbie is there, and here Barbie as well. So let's do an update content. Um, obviously, it's an audit log, it's not that exciting, but um, you get the idea of what's going on. Um, so she's creating a site. But clothes, and you can probably see there somewhere uh, what's going on. I can't see very well myself. What's that one? Some read events going through. Um, and now we've got this Alfresco audit events topic that's been created automatically for us. And there's also, as if by magic, an Alfresco repo activities topic which I didn't create. So, what happens with um, Alfresco from 5 on? If you start the, the two subsystems that come with it, messaging and events subsystems, It'll automatically start sending you events to ActiveMQ, um, and you can change that config using Alfresco Global Properties to send it somewhere else. And so what I've done is I've sent those instead of ActiveMQ, I'm sending them to Kafka Topics, um, and that activities feed is um, it's basically the, almost the share activities feed with a few extras on. We used it for the analytics pro, uh, version one. Um, so this, uh, so we've got the audit feed and got the activities feed, and um, also, uh, you can also do process. So, the embedded activity is only for embedded activity at the moment. It also has topics that come just out of the box with Alfresco, you just turn them on. So, if you've already got that 5.0 installation, you start those two subsystems up, you get some of this information. So, here I'm just starting a workflow so that you can see the events coming through and see what the topics are. Uh -huh. I build up suspense, but it's a video, so it's going to work, I know. <laughs> anyway, um, Alfresco repo activity step, you may see the Alfresco repo activity process and that Alfresco repo activity variable. So those are now new topics that come from activity events. Um, not just listeners do the same approach, listens for them, sends them to Camel, and sends them out as topics. Um, and I'm just going to connect to that topic, and uh, you can see those events coming through as well from the, from the beginning. Okay, so you may be able to see somewhere, yeah, task creating, task assigned. So those are the standard activity task events that are coming through that then you can process with whatever you want. Um, as I said, this is Kafka, but you can do whatever you want really with these. Once you've got them, you can change them, configure them um, to be whatever you want. Right. Yeah, and that's just a mention of that first project I was talking about, the URL. <coughs> um, so just two things to highlight on this is that much of this you can do with Alfresco Global Properties. You don't actually need jars or config or things like that. You can change a lot of it with Alfresco Global Properties. Um, and the other thing is that uh, there's a uh, branch on this project which just says to files. So if you just want to see those events coming through just to the file system, you could use that project just to see what happens. Okay. Next subject, Camel still, Camel's just about. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about machine learning. Um, I'm thankful I've got 10 points, so I can't go into a lot of detail about this, um, but I will talk a little bit about machine learning. Um, and really, there's, there's a couple of approaches you could take. One approach you could take would be to kind of assume that um, Alfresco uses a social may or may not be the case, but things like they like things, they comment on things, they download things. Um, so there's a social assumption there. Or if you assume that people are antisocial, or well, don't do that, um, you could just use the metadata or the content. So purely metadata, 
or the content so things like um, named entity abstraction or summarization based on the content. There's different approaches. I'm going to start with the first one. So something that I, I did in uh, my uh, I time at AlphaScope. I time is like innovation time you get. Okay. So I've just told you how to get the events to Kafka. And once they're in Kafka, you can use any sort of client to read those events. And so what I did for this was um, Apache Spark has got very good support for Kafka. And so um, not only has it got Apache Spark, but it comes with its machine learning library of algorithms. So I took um, the event data and I applied the collaborative filtering, well, this is the alter alternatively squares algorithm to the data to try and recommend, to do like a recommendation like in Netflix or Spotify or something like that, um, try to do a recommendation of um, nodes that are of interest. So this particular algorithm is really based on this one class, and that is a rating class. And at the top, you'll see there's basically three variables. So you've got a user, which is an integer, so you just hash up your user. Um, the product, um, for us, for us, there's going to be a node ref, and again, you just like create a number out of it. So you've got a node ref, a user, and then you've got a rating. Now that's a bit of trouble because we haven't really got ratings and it's used all the rating plugins. So what I did for this was I just put my kind of um, indicative rating myself. Oh, I've gone one too far. Okay. So for instance, if you downloaded something, I gave it a seven. If you uh, liked it, I gave it a nine. If you commented on it, I gave it an eight. And then you've got those three variables that you can plug into your model. And what you do then is you basically uh, I use six months production data from our internal Alfresco instance and uh, created a model based on that and had a few goes of creating a, a decent model and then um, once you've got the model you can use it and so I would say for this particular user can you give me 10 node references that are, I haven't seen before that may be of interest and um, there's no wonderful demo to show you this because it's basically bunch of node refs, but there we are. That's the 10 node refs. <laughs> and they're really interesting, I can tell you. Um, yeah, essentially, it returned the 10 node refs. And it was actually, it worked reasonably well, considering it was a bit of a hack together. Um, so that is a one um, way of doing it, would be to assume that people are social and people act, interact with the repository that way. Of course, that's not always the case. People aren't always social, as you know, many developers in the room. Um, so the other uh, one other approach you could look at is metadata, or content or metadata, but maybe a purely metadata approach. So if you just take a moment to look at those three files there, maybe I'll quit have a drink of water. What can you tell me about them? The reports. Yeah, they're, they're uh, well, they're, they're um, release reports for May. And you can see the dates on there. So there's, there's actually two series there. There's a date series and there's a version series. But as human beings, you did that really quickly. You could just look at it and you could see it. Whereas a computer's really not very clever at that sort of thing. You have to kind of tell it to do that sort of thing. Um, but just from the file name, you can tell that's part of a series. So one approach would be to look at similar sort of documents here. It's the ADF um, project. And um, so what I did, I, I looked at the file names, just the file names, and tried to identify dates. And then I went through a variety of date formats because obviously dates are in different formats and different languages. But if you take off the dates, you've basically got like a key and all these are our architects called. And then um, I was very proud of myself. Um, I picked the ADF. You see the PDF, it's got like a, it's, it's a group there. That's, that was my CSS skills. Um, so that shows it's in a group. So what I did is I, I worked out if they're in a group or not based on this date thing. And I stored that in Solar, and then now you can um, see if they're in a group. So there's some that's not in the group, for instance. And then you can do something like that. So purely based on the, the file name, the data, you say, this document is a part of this group. It's part of a series. I mean, dates, dates are very, very common series, but there's other series like um, product version or whatever custom version things you've got. Um, and really, this, the use case for this, I think, is more like if you were looking at a document, you could do next and previous, or last year and, and this year, or last month and this month. This is like intelligent understanding of the data. And also maybe um, if somebody added something new to that series, 
if you like, a real-time notification to tell you that you know, there's a new architect's call document. Okay, next subject. Any guesses? This is going to be anomaly detection. Okay, so um, uh, to my, I now work in search services and myself and Michael and Joel and Andy and Harry's the product manager and Joel um, works a lot in solar itself. So this is a commit that he did recently to solar, which isn't in Alfresco yet, but um, it's something related to what we've just been talking about. So it's a stream expression um, and the idea behind it is that it, you query a collection, but instead of returning the documents you normally get, it actually returns the significant terms in that document. So for instance, in this diagram, um, if you, did a, you set, specify your search criteria, and the results of that search criteria will be at A there, and then you compare them to the, the whole background index. And what this does is um, it tries to assign a higher score to terms that are more frequent in the foreground and rarer in the background. Um, this is quite conceptual, but um, if, to give you an example, the idea behind this would be something like um, fraud detection, where you're trying to detect fraud, uh, you've got a bunch of um, insurance claims, and uh, you, somebody's identified a bunch of insurance claims, they think it's a bit strange, they want to say, is there anything significant about those insurance claims? And perhaps you could discover that for those insurance claims, uh, there's a doctor that appears more frequently on those than normal. And that would be a way of doing a fraud detection based on significant terms. <coughs> Five, querying by SQL. Thankfully, Michael's doing a talk on this tomorrow or the day after, tomorrow? Tomorrow? So I don't have to talk about this one. It's good because I've got 10 things to do in such a short time anyway. But um, uh, I would say the previous one and this one are not actually in Alfresco yet, but they're something that us as a team are working on. Um, and we hope to get them out probably well, I will commit sometime in the future. Um, but querying by SQL is basically using a SQL interface to, um, to query Alfresco or query Solar. And Michael's going to tell you all about that tomorrow. Okay, six. Charts. Now, I know you're thinking charts there. It's not very exciting, they're a bit boring really, what there's charts about. But actually, uh, to be honest, Alfresco is not that exciting, document management is not that exciting really, is it? <laughs> yeah, it's a bit dull. What, what, what you really want is something kind of dreamy. This is my attempt at finding the dreamy camel photo. It's a bit disturbing, I find, but there we go. Um, so charts are really, they pimp your repository, they make things look nice. Take, for instance, Chart.js. Look at that, simple yet flexible JavaScript charting. Um, Look at the, uh, it's got mixed chart types, it's open source, um, it's got these lovely animations, look, oh, it's wonderful. Um, <laughs> HTML5 canvas, responsive, it's a beautiful thing of beauty. And if you look at a document library, it's not really a thing of beauty. So you might want to pimp your repository. And um, this is something that Mike Farman did, uh, it's, many of you might know Mike Farman. Um, and so he's done that. Um, He's used chart.js to pimp his repository for, for sales pushes and things like that. Uh, I did encourage him to open source this code, but um, he's a bit embarrassed about the, the query builder. He's, but um, the actual concept is fairly straightforward. I'll just take you through it. Essentially, he's got a custom web script which talks by the search API to Solar, returns the results, and um, I put chart.js over on the right-hand side here. Um, it just basically transforms the result into a format that your charting library can understand. Um, you can replace that with anything on the right hand side, with any charting library. The, the idea is basically you do a search and then you transform it into a format that your charts would prefer to see. Um, and like I said, he, he's not quite ready to open source it, but hopefully he would. But uh, the reason I mentioned this is because it's quite straightforward to do and you could do it yourselves. So we uh, have considered using that approach. <coughs> Okay, I look at these things and think, well, why didn't I choose that? Um, ah, this is because it looks like a camel, but it's actually not a camel. So, what I'm talking about is a custom RESTful API. So, 
by now you should have heard a lot about the Alphrasco One API is the effort that's gone into making it consistent and usable. Um, this is obviously API Explorer, um, but the URL structures are uh, very consistent. You can use get, post, put on entities, these I have here of entities. Um, the response codes are the same sort of thing. The response formats are also the same sort of thing. Um, wouldn't it be nice if you could write your own, um, as partners and community people, um, wouldn't it be nice if you could write your own API that conformed to these standards? Well, it's not very well documented, but um, I wanted to help you out. So I created a little project here using the uh, SDK version 3, which basically um, shows you how to do that. So um, in the readme, I show every single step from generating the SDK to producing an API. And um, we haven't currently got a category service API, so I just chose that as an example. structure says private my company because it's not a public um, URL it's actually a private one that you've created yourself and my company is whatever you want but of course and I'll show you how to do that in a minute but essentially what I'm doing is you can see us return the results that you would normally expect from an Alfresco API um, and I'm posted into a, a get categories root um, entity and then um, this is a child uh, child entity as well and you can see I'm doing post, and if you post, it does a 201 create. So it's all kind of following the standards that you'd expect from an API. Um, so I, what I've just done is I've created a demo category at the root, and then now I'm creating a child of that. And I'm going to call it Wales, because I'm Welsh. And it again is returned to 201, and you get the entry back. So. It's all, it looks like an Alfresco API, it acts like an Alfresco API, but it's a custom API that you could write yourselves. Um, and I'm just going to delete it again, so you're basically, I'm doing a delete to the, the um, node reference that you just got back, and that's now deleted, and it says a 204 no content. So, so you can see these, these, this API didn't take very long to write, and you could do it yourself. Now you've got six entries, we still have five before the demo. So a quick look at the code. This is a map that I used the SDK3, so it's just a plain old Java object, shit, plain old Java project. And the key thing here is there's this entity resource, category entity resource, which is annotated, you can see. And categories there will be the actual URL that you'll use. And you can see here it says private my company. That's how the URL is built up as well. So you could put anything in there. Um, and then there's the actions that you do on it. So you can see read, create, delete. If you implement those methods, then it's all handled by the framework to create um, <coughs> create these endpoints. And you see that no, there's no HTTP request or responses in there. It's all handled by the framework. So the, the responses are always consistent. You get the same kind of error codes and error messages um, with a consistent uh, API. And uh, where's it gone? Yeah, so I encourage you to check it out. Um, hopefully that's of use to you. <coughs> Oh, and by the way, I'm around for the rest of the week, so I asked to move this a bit further forward in my presentation so that I could talk to people and stuff if they, if they want to chat about this. So if you want to have a look at that and ask me some questions, you're welcome to. Okay. Next. This is Pimp My Camel, I think. Smart TV, so. Another picture. <coughs> this is a really quick one, so don't hurry up. Okay, so something you could also do is um, create an app for your smart TV. I haven't done an LG smart TV, I don't know if anybody else does. Um, but it's got, if you've used ADF, you'll know how to do this because it's basically just a custom JavaScript uh, framework to create custom um, components. Um, just a component library, you just you know, implement the methods and you can uh, create a components and, and then deploy them to your television. So this is the emulator, LG WebOS uh, emulator. So what I'm doing here is basically um, just doing a search, it's a solar search, search for documents, and you can see that I'm using the demo data still as always um, to, um, to find documents. So it does a search, it uses the Alfresco one APIs to return the results and return the thumbnails. 
And then uh, if you click on one of the items, good. if you click on one of the items, you've got a name and obviously the as speech and things like that. And um, there's also a full screen preview. Um, but um, this took me I know, a few hours to do. It's quite straightforward. Um, so if you feel the urge to do something like that, you could do that as well. Um, uh, I'm not sure about the source, but again, check out the frame is called Moon, I think it's, that just does those, those UI components. Five minutes left, I reckon. Yeah. Fine. Okay, Charlie Magnetic Expression. Why I mentioned this? Well, really, because I just worked on it, and um, we spent a lot of effort changing the, or adding new sharding methods for solar in 5.2 and one of them is property-based sharding. Um, and it is documented, but maybe not so well known, as this document for the, all the sharding approaches, that you could also shard by regular expression. So um, I Googled this. this. This regular expression in theory is sharding by domain name. I hope it's by domain name. So this is the test, actually, the, the test data I used to test this code out. But essentially, that will allow you to shard by domain name, if that's the sort of thing you want to do. So, Lots of flexibility in the sharding approach for solar. Okay. Almost there. 10, talking to Alfresco. Now, I'm not afraid of live demos. You may have seen some videos, but we're gonna go with the live demo in a minute. And um, with the live demo, it does depend on the wireless, so we should have a bit of fun. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so what am I talking about? This is a project by, um, Greg Milan, who's an architect at Alfresco, and he basically uh, integrated Alexa to Alfresco. <coughs> and uh, the idea is that you have an Alexa skill, and Alexa hears what you say, processes it, and you turn it into um, an intent with slots, and then that's, that can talk to any back-end API. Um, in this example, we use an Amazon Lambda to um, process those intents. And the Amazon Lambda is going to talk to an Alfresco instance, which is actually running on my machine, and get the result back, that's the idea. Um, so I had to do an ngrok to tunnel from a public Amazon endpoint back into my local machine. So in theory, um, we can do this sort of thing. Here we go, okay. Right. Um, Alexa, open Alfresco. Welcome to the Alfresco 1.0 Echo example. Is Alfresco up? You asked whether Alfresco is up. Alfresco is up. This sites. I found your sites. You have three sites. Your sites are 1. Spain 2. SWSDP and 3. Beacon. And list tasks. I found your tasks. You have two tasks. Your tasks are task number 109. It is a review task. Please review. It is due on the 27th of April 2017. And task number 182. It is a top task. Prepare for beacon. It is due on the 28th of April 2017. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Greg, Greg did the... Uh emotional experience. Um, I'm trying to find my cursor very quickly. Okay. Alexa, buy pink unicorn. <laughs> um, let's just try one more. So, um, Alexa, Alexa, open up Fresco. Welcome to the Alfresco 1.0 Echo example. Read document. Content, so we'll just change this. No. <laughs> <laughs> no content. I can't type that one hand. Read document. That's the end of the presentation. <laughs> I'm 
I'm sure we've got time for questions, but um, Alexa, stay around for a bit if you want to play with her. <laughs> she does. She is set to be a UK English, so you may struggle. With her. Yeah. Thank you.